Women's Breast Cancer Awareness Month, it's a good time to highlight the importance of education and research. We want to talk about how many women going through treatment for breast cancer do not get enough information on the risk to their fertility. So joining me now, breast cancer survivor Emily Purcell and our fertility expert, Dr. Marjorie Dixon with us right now. I think a lot of people don't realize um, the speed at which you were making huge life decisions when you are actually diagnosed and you're in your childbearing years. Um, you had your diagnosis, diagnosis for cancer in, was it 2015? Yes. And um, what were you faced with when you got that diagnosis? What did you have to think about? Um, a year of treatment and I was just recently married and whether or not to do fertility and it, I was diagnosed with stage three breast cancer so we already knew it was in my lymph nodes so we had to get to treatment really fast. Okay, so they, they know that you have stage three breast cancer. They also know that you might want to have children. Yes. How quickly do you have to make a decision about fertility and egg retrieval? How much time did you have? I had no time. I went for my first appointment within a week of being diagnosed with mm -hmm. my fertility doctor, and that day I started the therapy. I was, it was perfect timing for my cycle, and I knew I only had a few weeks to get it in, so we started that day. And then what happened that day? What did they actually do? You thought it was going to be a consultation. You brought your sister instead of your husband. Yep. So I phoned my husband and I was like, can we do this? And I phoned my parents to ask them if they can help me with the money because it was about three years ago. It was really expensive mm -hmm. for anybody. And um, I had an uh, ultrasound and then I was given the medication. So it's a sh at least one shot a day that I had to start giving myself. Mm -hmm. And then what happens? They retrieve eggs? Within a few, uh, about a week and a half, at, I was giving myself shot, at least one shot a day. Yeah. By the end, it was about two shots a day. And then they retrieved eggs. And at that same appointment, my husband gave his specimen as well. Okay, yeah. so they're all set up, and then is that it for fertility? Can they do anything else after that, or did you start chemo? I started chemo that the same day that my eggs came out. Wow. So, <laughs> so there was no time. It's like she said, there was no time. And, and Dr. Dixon, this, is, this actually happens quite frequently, does it not? It does, because it's a, it's, time is of the essence, particularly if the diagnosis is such that your oncologist will say, you have to have your eggs out by this date. Mm -hmm. You have to figure out how to get the eggs out by that date. And as she said, she arrived at the right time in the cycle. And if she came at the right time to start the medications, it's optimal to start the medications and get the eggs out before you're exposed to chemotherapy. Because okay. the chemotherapeutic medications are noxious to eggs, which is bad for the eggs, essentially. And you want to be able to retrieve before there's been any exposure to this chemotherapy. What about after she's gone through rounds of chemo and she's cancer-free, then she, can she try again? Yes, yeah, so there's an interim period where you shouldn't be trying to conceive because uh -huh. the retrieving of the eggs is one thing and you have them banked, but they're insurance, right? So some women after exposure to chemotherapy may be able to spontaneously ovulate mm -hmm. and be conceive thereafter once they're given the okay by the oncologist that it's safe to proceed. Not every breast cancer is the same. Not everybody's diagnosis at the, is at the same stage. Mm -hmm. And not everybody gets the same exposure to the same chemotherapy regimen. So right. you, it's really an individualized thing, but it's important to know that you may resume fertility thereafter, whereas other women may not have that ability and will have to have recourse to those frozen eggs. So it's, uh, it's a bit of a mixed bag, but it, the important part is to know that you must advocate for yourself because you had a great oncologist who actually phoned up the fertility specialist and this happens. We have phone friends in the medical community where people know that you will make an accommodation for a patient and fit them in quickly mm -hmm. if you know that they are in dire need of time to retrieve their eggs before they go on to their treatment. The point is you need to know your options. Yeah. And so your options were laid out for you. You could have that conversation and even though it was at warp speed, you could at least talk to your parents and your husband about it and decide what to do. Uh, since it's Breast Cancer Awareness Month, I want to talk uh, a little bit about breast cancer, the mm -hmm. prevalence of it. Mm -hmm. Uh, can you give us some stats, some facts? It is the most common cancer in North American women aside from um, skin cancer. Okay. But it is uh, the 
most lethal secondary to um, lung cancer. So okay. it's, you have to really, uh, the mortality rates have actually sta stabilized, they're not increasing and that's only because of things like this where we talk about awareness and people understand that, you know, screening, mammograms, we have now five decades, if not more decades of information and data where we can look and see and inform women about what they have to look out for. Women understand that you have to make healthy choices, um, things that predispose you being obese. Obesity is a predisposing factor to breast cancer because breast, uh, estrogen is stored in fat tissue. Um, alcoholic beverages, minimizing your alcohol intake, uh, knowing your family history. If you have a family genetic predisposition to breast cancer, for example, we talked about Angelina Jolie some time ago. She was mm -hmm. BRCA positive. So that's one of those where the, it's also associated with ovarian cancer. And the risk of ovarian cancer with that genetic predisposition is much higher than the average risk for women, which is 1 in 8 or 12 percent. So it's very important to be mindful of the fact that though um, it is a lethal cancer, mm -hmm. we are diagnosing it sooner because we understand about education and we mm -hmm. also understand about screening and we also understand about genetics and knowing your family history. So it's very important to talk about these things with your healthcare provider because as women, we keep calm, carry on, yeah. and um, we don't necessarily do a lot of remembering to screen. The screening for mammograms starts in our 50s now. We used to be told that it was in our 40s, but now in our 50s. It might be earlier if you have a first degree relative, so your mom or your sister who had breast cancer. Mm -hmm. um, and particularly if it was diagnosed premenopausally, um, those are the ones that can be much more aggressive and need to have seek treatment, so don't put off your treatment. Um, also know your ethnic background. It's more prevalent in um, non-Hispanic white women, mm -hmm. um, but the lethality is greater in women of African descent. Mm -hmm. And maybe that is because of the type of breast cancer that develops, the stage at the time that it's diagnosed. Um, so it's important to do a little bit of research, understand what your risks are for your ethnicity, for your age. Um, the most common time that women do develop breast cancer is postmenopausally. Okay. And that's between the ages of 55 and 65. So that's the greatest prevalence, but we know you're not there. <laughs> so right. as you know, there can be outliers, right? So, so is, is it skewing younger or not? No, it's so still, it's been because I thought it's, for some time that it was, we were getting worried because it was skewing younger. It's now stabilized. The okay. rates have been steady in the younger women. Yeah. Um, but it's decreasing actually in older women only because of the fact that we're doing all of these screenings and understanding. Yeah. And there are little, um, there are periodic increases in incidents because of things like in 2003 there was something called the Women's Health Initiative study and women had been on hormone replacement estrogen and progesterone and we know that sometimes being exposed to estrogen and progesterone can increase the risk of breast cancer. Once that stopped and women decided we're not going to take a lot of hormone replacement or we'll decide who is exactly the right person to get hormone replacement, uh -huh. then there was a dip yes. in breast cancer cases. So um, do the things that are good for your health. Yes. Don't smoke, exercise, um, eat well, know your family history, and do what you can in a lifestyle way to minimize risk, but understand that if you need to see a physician, you have to trust your physician, and then talk about your fertility options, because if having a family is important to you, particularly with your own eggs, it's important to get those eggs out before you're exposed to the chemotherapy. Emily, was there anything you wish you knew that you weren't told, or did you feel like the whole thing was sort of laid out for you so that you can make a prop proper decisions? not just fertility related, but anything with, with breast cancer? Um, uh, probably around my diagnosis. You know, I, it, was, it took a few months to actually get diagnosed and the tumor continued to grow because I'm so young. I was 27 when I was diagnosed. So that I wish, you know, I knew to advocate for myself more back then. Yeah. Um, well, this is hopefully the message that we can get out for uh, viewers that are watching and young women that are watching, and of course, the healthcare professionals. I mean, you guys are so on point now um, with trying to get that education out there for women. So thank you so much for your story, and thanks, Dr. Dixon.